Hey guys, it's Andre here from High Performance Academy. Welcome along to another one of our webinars. And today we're going to be covering a topic that I know there's a huge amount of confusion out there in the general automotive performance industry about the topic of harmonic dampers, what they do, what they don't do, and why you may or may not need one on your next engine build. Before we get into that though, I'll just cover off what's been going on over the last week. And last week, if you did join us, I was talking about our FJ40 project car and a little bit uh, of a departure from the norm here at High Performance Academy is definitely not what you would class as high performance. It's definitely not a race car and is not really designed to go fast. But last week I did talk about the fact that we were going to repower the existing Toyota 3B diesel engine, uh, which is lethargic at best. Uh, and we wanted something that had a little bit more power, but I also wanted to stay true to the Toyota original uh, manufacturer. I don't really like different engine and manufacturer swaps between chassis and engines uh, in general. There's some exceptions but generally that's just the way I like to roll if possible. So uh, given that we have got a bit of experience now with our Toyota 86 race car with the uh, 1UZ, 2UZ, 3UZ platform, it was a pretty uh, natural progression to go down that path. I didn't want to go anything with a turbo and I wanted to just keep it relatively simple, naturally aspirated. Uh, there isn't a huge amount of real estate inside the FJ40 engine bay as well, so I didn't want to overly complicate that with the likes of turbochargers, and again, we weren't chasing huge power. Uh, if we head across to my laptop screen for a moment, uh, we got our new donor engine arrived. So this is actually our second 3UZ in the space of about uh, six or seven weeks here. The other one was a donor engine for our race engine build, but this one, uh, what we wanted was a good known runner, and that can be a little bit trickier to find. So I just want to talk about some of the things you can look for that will help you out if you are looking for an engine swap and a donor for an engine swap. So as we can see, we've got the engine there sitting on the pallet. Uh, interestingly, this was an actual complete engine conversion kit. So we can see uh, over here, we've got the automatic transmission, absolutely zero use to us. Depending on what we do with the uh, drivetrain though, uh, we're looking at different options at the moment. The bell housing that we've got here may end up being useful possibly as part of a uh, conversion there. There's a couple of different uh, bell, uh, different gearbox options that we can go with and a lot of it comes down to the length overall of the transmission. Being that the FJ40 is an incredibly short wheelbase vehicle, uh, putting in a relatively long transmission such as the R151 out of the Toyota Hilux four-wheel drives basically ends up with the, uh, the tail shaft being incredibly short. So we're just toying with the different options there. The other one is the H55F that comes, sorry, H55, I'll get it around the right way, which comes out of the 70 series Land Cruiser. That's a little bit shorter. So again, just looking at our options there. So again, that transmission, not a huge amount of use to us. Given that all of the 3UZs and 1UZs came out with automatic transmissions behind them, there are no manual 1U or 3UZ engines. Uh, this is basically scrap value anyway. The wrecking yards uh, don't really have a lot of of value in them so that's probably why we got that. It's also got the complete wiring harness and uh, ECU as well as the immobilizer key but again none of that's really that relevant to us. Now getting on to what you can actually do when you're buying a, an engine from a wrecking yard and most of these will come with usually it's a startup warranty but uh, that can be a little bit of a bittersweet pill because often with projects they tend to go over time and uh, often you'll find that these engines will come up with something like a three month startup warranty but you might actually not get to a point where you can actually start the engine for six months, 12 months, even a couple of years depending on how elaborate your project is. So at the time you go to start it, if you find you've got a problem with the engine, uh, often you're kind of stuck and there's probably not a lot of comeback against the wrecker that you've purchased the engine off. So a couple of things that we can check, the first one, it is, and this is a really, really simple one, is just to remove the oil filler cap as we can see here. It's a reasonable gauge on the rest of the condition of the engine just to check underneath the oil cap. So uh, what we're looking for here is just to make sure, I don't know why my little point is not working too well, but it's uh, having a lazy day. And we're looking underneath the oil filler cap, making sure that there isn't a uh, massive build up of black grunge and uh, carbon deposits. Also, if there's sort of a milkshake looking uh, condition underneath there, also probably a pretty good sign 
find that uh, things may not be that good with your engine. And at the same time, if we actually look inside the oil filler on the engine, the rocker cover, the cam cover, uh, we're looking there for, again, no build-up of grunge, sludge, etc. And in a perfect world, what we're looking for is something that's going to be relatively like, sort of honey-coloured that uh, would indicate that the engine has at a minimum had reasonably frequent and consistent oil changes that has allowed carbon build-up inside of the rocker cover. So that's something you can do very, very simply. Quite, a, quite often get asked, well, why can't we do a compression test on the engine? And in some instances you can, uh, depending on how the starter motor is uh, f f mounted to the engine, often it's quite easy, and particularly with the 3UZ, 1UZ, 2UZ, the starter motor actually bolts to the engine block rather than to the bell housing of the gearbox, and this means that it is actually installed in the valley uh, between the two banks of cylinders. So it's relatively straightforward to hook up a battery temporarily, or a jump pack even, and crank the engine over, so by pulling the spark plugs and coils out, you can perform a compression test even in the wrecking yard before you take the engine uh, away with you. Most wreckers would probably have little trouble with doing that, it's pretty clear why you're doing it. But there's a bit of a caveat with that, sometimes this isn't a real clear cut test on whether the engine is actually in good condition. Obviously when you're doing this test you are looking for even compression across all the cylinders. However, what we'll often find with wrecking yard engines is that they have sat for a long time and given that they'll have sat with some of the valves open for a long period of time, we can get a mild build up of corrosion on those valve seats. Now what that will do is when we do a leak down test, or sorry, compression test uh, for the very first time like this, uh, we're actually going to end up with a high amount of leakage or a low compression test on those cylinders. So it can give you a false sense that there's something actually wrong with the engine. On the other hand, if we did persevere and we got the engine up and running, you generally find with light corrosion on the valve seats like this that uh, basically once the engine's been running for a few minutes and up to temperature, everything sort of settles down and it actually might not be the end of the world. So this is where it can be a little bit tricky to decide. On the basis of a compression test like that. Is there a problem with the engine or not? That's where you kind of have to take the uh, the warranty that the wrecker offers uh, to, to their word and assume that if you do find that there is a bigger problem that they're going to honour that issue. Uh, the other thing you can do if you're going to get a little bit more involved, unfortunately I don't have one here off our other 3UZ to show you, but it's not a big job to remove one of the rocker covers off the cylinder heads. and. Uh, uh, about five minutes work with a 10mm socket and an impact driver and you'll have that off and what again we're looking for here is that nice honey colour. So again I don't have the rocker cover here in front of me but uh, what I do have is a couple of components from inside the engine. Uh, so first of all if we look at this under our overhead camera this is the oil pickup from our 3UZ donor engine and this is about as good as you could expect in terms of condition from an engine that's almost certainly done in excess of 100,000 kilometres. Again not got that nice honey honey glaze colour, uh, there's no build up of carbon deposits or grunge on that. Uh, so that's what we're trying to look for uh, on the rocker covers and again I've got a part of the windage tray here from inside of the sump and again everything's looking really nice on that. So uh, if you've got an engine that you pull apart as a donor engine and it looks something like that, it's not a complete guarantee that the rest of the engine is in perfect condition, but it probably can give you some satisfaction that the engine is likely to have at least been looked after. And particularly with these 3UZ engines, uh, they in stock form out of Japan uh, weren't exactly what you'd class as a high performance car, weren't heavily modified so there's a pretty good chance given the numbers that are around there that you are going to be uh, getting a good one if it does look a little bit like that. Uh, right, and a little update with our Racecraft sister company. So for those who have never heard of Racecraft before, we launched Racecraft back in December. It's an offshoot of High Performance Academy, basically got the same team running it. Very similar concept, online education in the performance automotive industry. Uh, this time we're focusing on race car setup and development, driver education. And we split it off because we just felt there was enough of a distinction uh, between the subjects we teach in HPA and what we wanted to cover in Racecraft. So our 
our four, first course, as I mentioned, launched back in December, and that is our Wheel Alignment Fundamentals or Motorsport Wheel Alignment Fundamentals course. And we are back into filming at the moment for our second course, which is our corner weighting course. And uh, a lot of people may not understand what corner weighting is, what that actually means. So let's jump across to my laptop screen for a moment. And uh, this is uh, a shot we took when we were over in the UK back in July last year at Joda Sport. Uh, Joda Sport run the Jackie Chan DC Racing LMP2 Orica race cars and that's what we can see here this is the Orica chassis set up on their flat patch. So everyone probably understands that wheel alignment is pretty important but it's really easy to overlook that the corner weighting or corner balance is just as important to the overall balance of the car. So professional race teams like this go to a lot of trouble to set these up. So what we can see here is that each corner of the car is sitting on a set of scales. These are all set on a perfectly flat surface, that's the flat patch below the car and that's actually a calibrated surface so uh, every year our, uh, Joda Sport have a uh, technician come around and will actually laser level that surface, it's all adjustable to make sure that their setups are always consistent. So basically the corner weighting system measures the weight applied to each corner of the car and this can have a big impact as I've mentioned on the balance of the car, the handling performance, particularly if you've got an imbalance or you can have an issue where the car will turn much better in one direction than the other. With these Orica chassis, even though the driver, which you can kind of just see in here, is slightly offset to the left, it's not a full left hand drive and uh, they actually end up with a very very even split in weight, particularly across the front axle line. In the front axle line is really really important because any imbalance particularly on a chassis that is as sensitive as the Orica LMP2 they've got an imbalance of more than about two kilograms from the left front to the right front wheel this will cause locking of one wheel uh, in braking so this is really going to impact on the braking performance of the car. Uh, at the same time, this particular car is also sitting on a set of what's called setup hubs. So obviously, it's got no wheels, no tyres on it. Instead, these uh, CNC billet alloy setup hubs are uh, fitted to the car during the setup process. And there's a few advantages or reasons why they do this. First of all, it's got a couple of rollers which are a little bit hard to, to see here. So these sit on top of the corner weight scales and what it does is it removes any inaccuracy that can be caused by uh, the tyre deformation, tyre pressure, uh, even build up on a used slick tyre. So that's one aspect. Not such an issue with the Orica because as we can see back here, uh, they do run inboard push rod suspension front and rear so adjustability to uh, aspects such as ride height is really easy to get to but uh, on a normal road car which might run double wishbone or McPherson strut with the damper kind of mounted somewhere in here in behind the hub assembly uh, with the wheel on it's basically impossible to get in there and make ride height adjustments or adjust your toe etc uh, while the car's on the setup patch so using the setup hubs this allows you the freedom to do that and it just adds to the consistency of the results that you're going to get. Uh, in this instance as well, a little bit outside of the topic of corner weighting but uh, you might be able to see it here, there is actually a piece of nylon string running from the front to the back of the car and this is used for setting the toe. So you can see there are a couple of little patches here on the setup hub and these represent the width of the normal racing rim that's fitted to the car by measuring from the little patches or flags as they're referred to out to the string uh, this allows the technician to measure and adjust the um, the toe settings on each corner of the car so uh, that corner weighting course uh, we hope to have out in the not too distant future we've filmed the studio component we're just getting into our worked examples now as well as our workshop components of that course so hopefully again we'll have it out in the not, not too distant future. Now, it's definitely not a course that's going to be for everyone. The reason for this is that the required sort of entry cost a set of the corner weighting scales is pretty expensive. They have come down massively in price over the last decade or so as is most of the componentry we use but you're still probably looking at north of about a thousand US dollars for a set of corner weight scales. So definitely for the average weekend warrior probably not something you're going to be investing in but it's getting to a point now where they are within reach of maybe uh, two or three friends in a group who go racing, maybe uh, pulling their funds and buying a set between them because it's not something that you're going to be using constantly uh, and that can be a really cost effective way of getting you into the game.
Um, now, something I haven't talked about so far with any of our webinars, and I just wanted to mention this as well, if we jump on t across to my laptop screen. Uh, if you head over to the article pages on the hpacademy.com website, we do release technical articles from time to time. Uh, of course, with the COVID-19 shutdown, we had a little bit more time on our hands than usual, so there's a few updates in there. Uh, in particular, the last couple of articles we released, uh, we've got one there on piston ring end gaps, everything you need to know, what affects your piston ring end gap, how to measure it, and how to correctly adjust it. i uh, also got an article in there by Brandon, our in-house 3D modeling guru slash wiring guru slash basically anything else that needs to get done Brandon will do it and uh, he'll teach you everything you need to know about relays and how they work so if you've got a bit of downtime check out the articles page on our website now this next aspect I just this sort of follows on a little bit from uh, what I was talking about in our webinar last week we were talking about tuning for altitude but uh, in there I talked a little bit about turbo performance I just wanted to touch on this in a little bit more detail so this is an Instagram we put up uh, a few days ago Ago, and it's a shot of a FD RX7 drag car that uh, we did a tech tour of over in Australia. It's powered by a 13B turbo engine, but uh, really the aspect we're mo most interested in here is the elaborate intake. So you can see uh, there's a big carbon fibre intake here that is sealed to the compressor inlet, uh, and this is obviously fed fresh air straight from the front of the car. It runs a one piece carbon uh, front end with no air inlet other than to this turbo. Charger. So the idea here is that at high speed, particularly maybe 200 mile an hour or thereabouts, uh, it can be uh, can create positive pressure at the compressor inlet. So where this, why this is important is it's not just the boost pressure in the inlet manifold we need to consider when it comes to turbo performance and where the turbocharger is operating on a compressor map. What we're actually interested in or what matters to the turbocharger is the pressure ratio that the turbo compressor is operating at. So when I use that term compressor, so pressure ratio, what we're talking about is the pressure, the absolute pressure at the compressor outlet compared to the pressure at the inlet. So the pressure right here actually has a really big impact on the turbo performance. Now obviously this is a pretty unique example but why I wanted to mention this is two aspects. First of all if you've got a factory intake system and some are much better than others but particularly on a restrictive factory intake system, particularly if you've got an air filter that's well past its use by and is restricting airflow through the filter, what you can find is that at high boost and high RPM because of that restriction pre-compressor, pre-turbo, it actually creates a a low barometric air pressure, or low air pressure at least, uh, at the compressor inlet, and this influences our uh, pressure ratio. So to see how that works out, let's just have a quick look at a compressor map. This is just a random Garrett compressor map that I grabbed. The actual specifics don't matter. But uh, let's look at how this works. So let's bring up our calculator for a second, and let's say we are running 300 kPa of absolute pressure in the inlet manifold. So uh, that's 200 kPa of positive pressure, so around about 2 bar of positive pressure, 29 psi. So let's say we are operating w at uh, normal sea level, standard sea level pressure of 101.3 kPa, uh, and we've got uh, an air filter system just like that RX-7 that we looked at. So what this means is that the pressure ratio we're working at there, 2.96, let's call it uh, 3.0 just for rounding sake. Uh, so we're operating, whoop, let's try and draw a straight line would probably help. We're operating somewhere through here. Now uh, where about specifically we are within this compressor map is going to depend on uh, the corrected airflow which we've got down the bottom. That's not really my, my point that I'm trying to make here but you can see if you were at a pressure ratio of 3.0 you could end up right in the meat just about of the efficiency of that compressor map up around at least 76% which is not bad going. So let's say that uh, we take our car and we drive up to the top of Pikes Peak where our atmospheric pressure, our barometric air pressure is now down to about 65, 68 kPa depending on the day. So let's see how that all pans out. We enter 300 kPa into our 
calculator, divide that now by 65. You can see that our pressure ratio now jumps up to 4.6. So we're, we're actually right off the scale here. We're, we're well up over here and uh, this isn't going to work out too well for our turbo. That's obviously an extreme example, but the same effect that we see when we drive from low altitude to high altitude in terms of our dropping barometric air pressure, uh, we see exactly the same effect with a really restrictive intake system. So this is one of the places where it can be quite easy to gain a, a reasonable amount of power essentially just about for free. If you've got a pressure drop at the compressor inlet, you can revise your intake system, get rid of that restriction. Uh, you're going to end up with the same manifold pressure in your in inlet manifold, but the turbo operating at a lower or overall pressure ratio. And of course, in that little example I gave there, this is why we really need to be very mindful uh, in specialist events like Pikes Peak Hill Climb uh, to monitor whereabouts we are operating in the compressor map because it's very easy to have a combination that's dialed in and ideal or optimised at sea level and find out at 14,000 feet that we actually have to drop our manifold pressure significantly uh, to keep the turbo in one piece. Uh, if nothing else, irrespective of the compressor efficiency we'd be operating at, uh, we'll probably find that we end up destroying the turbo because we overspeed it before we actually uh, get anywhere. So uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, also, we'll just jump across to our YouTube channel and on that little trip that we did over to uh, Sydney Jamboree, which unfortunately was rained out and then everything got closed down because of COVID, uh, we did get the opportunity to talk with Joe from Team Caram Racing uh, about this immaculate Evo that they've built. Now, it's definitely not the fastest in the world. Uh, it's run a best of about 10.5. It's producing about 870 wheel horsepower. Uh, at the moment, running what is still a relatively small turbo for a 2.2 litre stroke of 4G63. Some interesting aspects on this car though that we do cover in particular, uh, in my opinion one of the worst kept secrets in import drag racing or four wheel drive drag racing at least which is the clutch slipper device. Uh, this is something we pioneered along with probably a bunch of other people around the world that were doing exactly the same thing secretly at the same time. But for our own drag car that held the four wheel drive Evo world record, the clutch slipper was the absolute key to getting that thing off the line with some level of consistency and most importantly making sure that we weren't smashing drivetrain components every time we sidestep the clutch. So we'll find out all about the clutch slipper valve. Uh, also this uh, car is running the FT600 ECU which is a nice segue into our current giveaway uh, which is for the FuelTech FT550 ECU, little brother to the one that Karim Racing, Team Racing are using. So the FT550 ECU, there's three days left for this giveaway to run. So you've still got time to get into the draw. You're going to get the FT550 ECU, which also acts as a dash display as well as a logger. Uh, it basically does just about everything you'd expect from a modern ECU. It's got sequential injection, direct spark ignition. Uh, it'll do advanced traction control, boost control, nitrous control, variable valve timing control, drive-by-wire throttle, closed loop O2 control, just to name a few. Uh, it's also touchscreen though so you can make some key adjustments straight from the touchscreen without needing your laptop. So we are including the FT550 thanks to FuelTech USA along with our suite of tuning courses so that you're going to know exactly what to do once you've got that ECU installed and up and running in your car. So you can head along to the link which I'll get uh, Luke to drop into the comments and get your name into the drawer and uh, when you go along to that link as well there are a few other little tasks that you can do to get yourself a few extra entries and give yourself the best chance possible of winning and regardless whereabouts you are joining from in the world we will ship that to your door so don't think that you're going to miss out just because you're not in the US or you're not in New Zealand. Alright uh, thanks for watching our pre-show there give me a few moments and we'll get started with our webinar today. If you liked that video make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.